Здравствуйте. Welcome to Russian Through Propaganda. Today's day 16. We're going to learn the accusative case today. Uh, it may sound daunting to do two cases in one chapter, but uh, we're going to find out today that the accusative singular is pretty easy. There's actually going to be only one new ending we have to learn in order to use the accusative in Russian. So that's some good news. Um, first, I'd like to just quickly review uh, concerning verb conjugation and verb types, right? Uh, that, first of all, the types we're using in the book uh, are not something that Russians use, right? We discussed already that, of course, people who are native speakers of Russian simply learn, uh, you know, as children how to conjugate verbs. So it's not something they really have to think about most of the time. Um, so uh, if, you're, if you look in other textbooks, for example, or in dictionaries, you're not going to see these verbs listed according to the types I'm using. Again, I, I inherited this system from a professor of mine at Princeton, Charles Townsend, uh, so uh, it's something that I really liked, and I, I think it's maybe the most convenient way to, to categorize these things. Uh, now keep in mind also that the, the, the names we're giving the verbs aren't in, entirely arbitrary, right? They often really tell us something about how the verb was built in the first place, right? By adding a certain suffix, for example, or, or by adding no suffix at all, right? Like remember the verb zhit, right, which is a non-suffix verb. Uh, but the problem there is that the, the infinitive ending, the, the tia, uh, so to speak, gobbled up the final uh, part of the stem, the v, right? So uh, for all the different types of verbs, the, the verb tags uh, tell us something about how the verbs are built. And by the way, if you go in to study other Slavic languages at any point, you'll see that these types we're using correspond pretty well across most Slavic languages. Of course, there are differences, and of course, including differences of spelling and things like that, but uh, these same basic types of verbs appear all across um, uh, the world of Slavic. Uh, so finally, I can't stress enough how important it is to, to really try to discipline yourself and drill these conjugation patterns as often as, as you can, uh, especially when you're drilling new vocabulary, right, uh, at the end of the chapter, or just anywhere, whenever you encounter a new verb, maybe you're watching one of the poetry readings that I do, right? Where I, or skipping ahead to some of the literary texts at the end of book two and books three and four, right? You'll see there that when we're uh, encountering all sorts of new verbs, I'm gonna be very careful to tag every, every last one of them, right? And so uh, the more of these you see, uh, the more accustomed you'll, you'll get to each verb type. And my advice is, especially at this point, uh, you know, every time you see a new I verb, try to quiz yourself. Just take a moment and say, okay, I, what's the first verb we learned like that? Uh, chitait, right? Chitait, 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 right? Run through the paradigm and then see if you can repeat that with the new verb you've, ju you've just seen for the first time. Um, so remember, uh, let's take a verb like, I'm just picking something at random, which, which means to tell or narrate, right? Well, if we tag that with an I uh, tag, then we should already be able to conjugate that verb. So that's a bit of a mouthful, right? So maybe a bit of a challenge at first, but the, the more you repeat these things, the better you'll get at it. Um, again, think of it like practicing your jump shot in basketball or something, right? Uh, if you do it enough, then the, the, if you learn the proper form to start out with, right, then the more you do it, the more it'll just come natural and you won't have to uh, think about it. Okay, so let's turn to today's grammar. Let's learn the accusative case. And um, if we look at this propaganda poster, we see basically all that we need to learn today about the accusative case. Well, in, in a nutshell, uh, the flag here says, Zarojinu za Stalina. Okay, and this banner contains the two... Uh, the two tricky parts about the accusative case, right? First of all, look at Stalin. Okay, that's a person, right? So uh, we discussed already that nouns referring to people and animals and things like that, things that move, are called animate nouns. Okay, and what other, so Stalin is, an, is a masculine animate noun. Okay, what about the other uh, noun here on the flag? Rojena is the nominative form of this. It means homeland. I think we've seen it already several times. Rodina, right, a feminine noun. Okay, uh, now how are these nouns being used here? Well, they're being used after the preposition za, which in this particular meaning takes the accusative, right? So here's our first um, preposition that simply requires the accusative to come after it. 
So that tells us that these two noun forms we're seeing are actually in the accusative. And so what do we notice? Let's start with rojana. Okay, so we see for feminine nouns, a becomes u. A becomes u. That's the rule for the feminine accusative in the singular. Now, what about nouns? What about feminine nouns that end in ya, right? Soft feminines. Well, take a wild guess. What are they going to uh, turn into in the accusative? Not u, but u, right? We're going to keep bas basically the same vowel shift, but just hard versus soft endings, right? A becomes u. Ya becomes you, and that's the rule. That's it for the uh, for the feminine accusative. Now, um, what about masculine animus like Stalin? Again, a, per a person's name, right? Uh, in the accusative, masculine animates look exactly like the genitive, right? So, in essence, we've already learned those forms, right? We learned them a few days ago when we learned the genitive, right? So we know that Stalin. Uh, could mean of Stalin or Stalin's, right? Expressing possession. Uh, that would be the genitive usage of that form. Uh, but now we see that the accusative form is exactly the same as the genitive. Okay, what about all other nouns, right? So we've just covered feminine and masculine animate. What about masculine inanimate nouns like computer, right? Just referring to things. Or what about all neuter nouns? Those forms don't change at all in the accusative. They look exactly like the nominative. Right? So, for example, the accusative of computer would be computer. The accusative of aknor, right, a neuter, would be aknor. Right? So we see that really the, the two things we have to worry about are feminines and masculine animates. Otherwise, uh, the accusative singular is extremely easy. It looks just like the nominative that we learned back in Chapter 1. Okay, last thing to mention. What... What is the accusative case? What's it used for? Well, of course, like all cases, it's used after certain prepositions. We just saw that with za, right? But generally, the most common use of the accusative is, uh, in, in Russian, is that direct objects appear in the accusative. Okay, what's the direct object? Well, you probably know already, but let's be sure, right? And so in uh, just simple sentences, uh, you're going to have a subject, usually, right? Like uh, the student. Uh, you're going to have a verb like uh, reads, right? And then the question, what what is the student reading? That what is going to be the direct object, right? So the student reads a book. The student reads the book or whatever, right? Book is your uh, direct object, right? It's the the thing, the, the, the object or person that is, so to speak, directly absorbing the action of the verb, right? He reads the book. Okay, so... Uh, Let's look at a few examples here, um, just reviewing some things. Let's start with some subjects in the nominative case, right? Back to chapter one. At the nova computer. Okay, why the nominative here? Because we're simply pointing at something and naming it, right? So we know already the nominative case is used for subjects of sentences. We're also simply for naming things. That's where we get the, the term nominative. It's related to the Latin nomen, which means name. Right, so it's the naming case, so to speak. Uh, at the nova computer, this is a new computer. Okay, let's look over at a feminine. At the nova kniga, this is a new book. Okay, there's our nominative form of that. At the nova student, this is a new student. Okay, so we have one nova computer is an inanimate example. Then we have nova kniga, that's a feminine. And then finally, we have nova student, which is a masculine animate example. Okay, let's put these into the accusative and see what happens. Well, computer, like all inanimate nouns, well, well, like masculine and neuter inanimate nouns, is going to stay the same, right? So, ya pokupayu novi computer. I'm buying, well, what are you buying? A new computer, right? That's the direct object. And it is in the accusative here, even though, again, it looks identical to the nominative, but we still say, right, in this sentence, it's playing the role of the direct object. It's in the accusative. Okay, I'm reading a new book. Yachitayo novoyu knigu. Right? So look what's happened. Uh, we, we've added an adjective in, into the mix here. Novaya kniga. So our endings are aya on the adjective, a on the noun, 
and we followed throughout the same old rule we formulated earlier. Ah becomes U, Ya becomes you. Right? So that gives us Yachitayu Novu Yu Knigu, right? Novaya Kniga becomes Novu Yu Knigu. Okay, and for Novi Student, that is going to look just like the genitive, right? That's an animate masculine. Uh, in the accusative, as a direct object, it's going to look exactly like the genitive forms we learned several days ago. Yavizhu novova studienta. Right here, this direct object is answering the question, whom do you see, right? Whom do you see? I see a new student. Okay, uh, so let's review a bit, right? Just to be clear, let's look at uh, a few more examples. Comparing the subject well, the nominative case, right, for subjects, the genitive case, and the accusative. And let's see which ones resemble each other. Well, here we have masculine examples, right? Et novi student, et ruski pisatil, et nashatiets. Okay, all those examples are masculine animate, right? So uh, whether we, we use these nouns in the genitive or the accusative, they're going to look exactly the same, right? So look in the black box there. You see we have examples comparing both usages, both cases, and we see the forms are identical, right? Uh, let's start with novi student. At the miesta novova studienta, right? This is the seat of the new student. Yaznayo novova studienta. I know the new student, accusative. Same forms. Okay, um, at the ruski pisatil, Russian writer. Okay, here's a soft noun uh, example, right? Pisatil. Это книга русского писателя. This is the book of the Russian writer. Я читаю русского писателя. I'm reading the Russian writer. Accusative. Finally, наш отец. Remember, there's a, a mobile vowel there. Отец, that yeah is a mobile vowel, so it drops out when we add our accusative ending. And we can say, for example, это машина нашего отца. There's the genitive usage, right? This is the car of our father. And accusative, we love Nashava Atsa. We love whom do we love? Our father. We love our father. Accusative. Uh, so that means in essence we only have the one new ending to learn today, right? The U basically, right? For feminine accusatives, um A becomes U, right? That's really all you need to remember. A becomes U. And then as so often in Russian, right, we just have to watch out for the soft version of that same rule, right? If A becomes U, Ya becomes U. Right, so let's look at some examples of the feminine uh, and just review the cases we know so far, right? So for feminines, of course, the genitive forms and the accusative forms are going to be different, obviously, right? So at the nova sorry, at the ruska piridacha, at the nova studentka, at the vasha statia. Okay, so there are three examples. Um, Right now, keep in mind, we didn't mention earlier that uh, animacy, for, for, the, for feminine nouns in the singular, the animate, inanimate distinction doesn't matter, right? So uh, you may be tempted to think that, well, an example like nova studienka, well, that's animate. Of course, it's animate. It refers to a, to a human being. But again, for grammar at this point in the singular, that doesn't matter, right? So this rule we just given, a ah, becomes u. And ya becomes you works for all feminine nouns in the singular that, that we've seen so far, right? Uh, so again, for feminine nouns, even if they're animate, the accusative doesn't look like the genitive. That's only for masculines, right? Uh, now, it may strike you sort of as unfair or sexist or something that the, right, why aren't feminines considered animate? Well, that's really just an, an accident of the grammar. When we get to the plural endings, we'll see that that distinction does matter. Right, so it's just kind of an accident of grammar, you know. And in some ways, the uh, the feminine is kind of distinguished by having its own uh, accusative, its own distinct accusative ending, right? Uh, whereas the masculine is just showing either nominative or uh, genitive forms, depending on the uh, animate or inanimate distinction. Okay. Anyway, I've maybe said too much about that. Let's look at the examples. At the Ruske Piridache, there is the nominative, right? This is a Russian broadcast. Okay, here's a genitive example. At the Natchala Ruski Piridaichi. This is the start of a Russian broadcast. Okay, there's the genitive of a Russian broadcast. And now accusative Yasmatru Ruskuyu Piridachu. Okay, 
Okay, what about, uh, here's again an animate example, but that doesn't matter here for feminines, right? At the nova studentka. Okay, again, it is animate, but it's going to behave exactly like Ruska Piridacha in the accusative. Okay, a genitive example. At the Miesta Nove Studienki. This is the place or the seat of the new student. Yaznaya Novo Studienku. I know the new student, female. Okay, one more inanimate example. This one's soft. At the Vashi Statia. Okay, genitive. At the Kanyets Vashi Statia. The end of your article. Ani Chitad Vashu Statiu. There's the accusative. They're reading your article. Okay, let's uh, do an, uh, fill in some uh, blanks here, just adding the accusative forms. Um, now, let's start with number one. Это наша новая кошка. Okay, now let's say something else about this um, topic and watch out for what case we need, right? We have to analyze a little bit to figure out what case we need in the given example. Okay, мы так любим. We so love. Okay, what are we missing here? We have a subject, we have a verb, we're missing a direct object, right? We so love our new cat, literally. Okay, so we've got to put Nasha Nova Koshka into the accusative. A becomes U, Ya becomes U, and that gives us Nashu Novu Koshku. We talk Lubim Nashu Novu Koshku. Okay, number two. At the photographia Maye Lubimui Tioti. Okay, what are we dealing with here in the example, in the first sentence? This is a photograph. Okay, what case is that phrase in? Let's think back. Can we think of the nominative, nominative of uh, this word, tiochi? right? It's a feminine noun. It means ant. Okay, so what case is this in? Uh, well, genitive, right? Uh, so let's think. Does that make sense? This is a photograph of our favorite ant. Okay, that makes perfect sense. It's clearly genitive. Now, this happens quite a bit when you're kind of juggling Russian words. You might first hear them in a case other than the nominative, right? So in that case, uh, if you're a beginner, right, you might have to take one step backwards, right, and think, okay, what's the nominative form of this in, in order then to put it into the accusative, right? So you may have, you have to really think carefully and at first maybe uh, do some legwork, right? Okay, so what will it be? Maya lubimaya tiochia. Right, that's the nominative form of that feminine noun. Okay, now it's much easier to put it into the accusative, right? Ya ochin rietke vizu. I very rarely see whom, right? Accusative. My favorite aunt. My you, lubimu you, tiochiu. Okay, so maya, lubimaya, tiochia becomes my you, lubimu you, tiochiu. Number three, as a sestra nashiva druga. Okay, that's in the nomin nominative, of course, right? This is the sister of our friend, our friend's sister. Мы хорошо знаем его blank. We well know his blank. So we know his sister well is what we're trying to say. So we need the accusative. Мы хорошо знаем его сестру. Okay, number four, вы видите эту новую студентку? Okay, what are we dealing with here? Uh, well, it looks like the accusative to me, right? Uh, okay, so again, we could recover the nominative working backwards, right? Where U is going to switch to A. That would be ETA NOVAYA STUDIENTKA. Right, that's our nominative form. And let's see what we need in the second sentence. Blank, 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 GOVARIT PARUSKI. Right, speaks in Russian. Okay, it looks like we need a subject, right? That verb needs a subject. Uh, so we use the nominative. Это новая студентка говорит по-русски. Uh, number five. Это ее новая статья. This is her new article. Okay, that's in the nominative. Okay, let's look at the example. The, the second sentence. Все читают blank. Everyone reads what, right? What are they reading? Okay, so we need an accusative. Uh, a becomes U, Ya becomes you. Now remember the your part is never going to change. That means her. Uh, remember that's one of those words that, that uh, never changes form. Все читают ее новую статью. Everyone's reading her new article. 
Number six, у тебя есть бабушка? Do you have a grandmother? Uh, okay. Ты часто видишь blank? Do you often see your grandmother? We need the accusative. Uh, ты часто видишь бабушку? Бабушку, accusative. Okay, now a second question. Есть фотография blank? Is there a photograph? Okay, the only thing that would make sense there is a, uh, a genitive, right? We don't even have a verb here, so we can't have a direct object, right? Uh, okay, would the genitive make sense? Is this a photograph of grandmother, meaning of your grandmother? Uh, yeah, that makes sense. So let's use the genitive. What would that be? Есть фотография бабушки, бабушки. By the way, for relatives and things like this, Russian often omits possessive adjectives, right? So in English, we'd say, is this a photograph of your grandmother? Uh, but in, in, in Russian, we would usually just leave out the your part of it because we it's just assumed that we know whose grandmother we're talking about, right? Uh, okay, number seven. У него была очень странная идея. He had a very strange idea. Right, a very strange idea was at him. Okay, second sentence. Я совсем не понимаю его blank. I completely don't understand his blank. Okay, looks like we need an accusative. Странную идею. Странную идею. I don't understand his strange idea at all. Совсем. Number eight. Моя, моя работа такая скучная. My work is so boring. Я ненавижу, I hate blank. Okay, sounds like an accusative. Я ненавижу мою работу. I hate my work, I hate my job. Okay, number nine. Это Маша, а это Таня. Okay, two uh, women here. It looks like we're introducing them. We're at least pointing at them. This is Masha and this is Tanya. Вы знаете blank and blank? Do you know these two people. Okay, so we clearly need the accusative. Вы знаете Машу и Таню? Okay, note the soft, right? The softness on Tanya, right? Я becomes you. And for a quick pasloviza, ruka ruku moyet. Hand washes hand. Okay, hand is ruka, feminine. And so we have one hand, ruka, nominative, and then ruku is the accusative. Hand, hand washes, literally. Hand washes hand, one hand washes the other. Manus manum lawat in Latin. Okay, uh, here's another uh, poster, rather gruesome. Vie fascistava gada, crush the fascist vermin. Okay, so you see it's a little... Looks like some kind of monstrous uh, spider that's shaped like a swastika. So this is from World War II, of course. And uh, a, a maybe slightly bizarre way to point out that basically anything that moves um, is treated as an animate uh, noun in Russian, right? So it doesn't matter if it's an insect or a spider or something like that. It's still going to be masculine animate if it's a masculine noun, like got. Okay, uh, let's do some more examples with masculines and neuters. And uh, now we've got to be careful, right? Uh, the last exercise we had all feminines. In the case of masculines and neuters, we've got to be careful. If they're inanimate, the accusative is going to look like the uh, nominative. If they're animate, the accusative will look like the genitive. Okay, so let's do number one and take the same example, right? Мы сегодня покупаем blank. Today we're buying blank. Okay, so we need a direct accusative, direct object in the accusative. Uh, okay, in the first uh, example, we're buying a Ruski Slavar. Okay, Russian dictionary. Is that animate or inanimate? Inanimate, of course, so it's going to stay the same. Мы сегодня покупаем Ruski Slavar. Right, same as in the nominative. But what about Novy Shinok, a new puppy? Okay, that's animate, of course, so this accusative is going to look just like the genitive endings. So you might need to look, peek back at day 11 or whatever it was when we learned the genitive. Right? Мы сегодня покупаем нового 
Shinka. Remember that mobile vowel. Novova Shinka. Number two, Nasha Abshijitia. Okay, so our dorm, and then we want to say my neighbor so hates, right? He hates it so much. He so hates blank. So neuter accusative remains the same. Okay, what about nash profesor? Well, that's animate, of course, right? So my neighbor so hates our professor. That form in the accusative here is going to need to look like the genitive. So that would be nashava profesora. Right? Mosasia tak nenavidit nashava profesora. Number three, etet pisatil. What does that mean? This writer. Uh, so this writer would be animate. Uh, the second phrase, etet vapros, this question, that's inanimate. Okay, so let's look at the example. Моя соседка хорошо понимает blank. My neighbor, a uh, female, my neighbor well understands this writer, literally, right? So she understands this writer well. Моя соседка хорошо понимает этого писателя, right? Again, animate, accusative, looks just like genitive. Here, watch out for the soft ending on писатель. Right, so we add the ya instead of a, ah, and we get rid of the soft sign. We don't need that anymore. Okay, what about my uh, neighbor well understands this question? Well, here vapros can mean something like matter, right? Like, or maybe even topic, right? Моя соседка хорошо понимает этот вопрос, right? Inanimate, so it's not going to uh, change. Number four, старый начальник, old boss. And old here could mean something like our former boss, right? Our, remember our old boss back at the old job, that type of thing. Я плохо помню. I poorly remember. Blank. Okay, again, we need an accusative. Старый начальник is animate. Uh, so it's going to look like the genitive. Я плохо помню старого начальника. Okay, starry kavur, the old carpet. I poorly remember the old carpet. Must not have been a very memorable carpet. Uh, it reminds me of the Big Lebowski. Uh, nice movie, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Okay, ya plocha pomnu blank. Okay, starry kavur, animate or inanimate? Of course, inanimate. So, ya plocha sorry, ya plocha pomnu starry kavur. Okay, number five, Bolshoi Dom, a big building. By the way, Dom, uh, it's often listed in dictionaries and textbooks as house, and it can mean house, but quite often in Russia, it really means an apartment building or just a building generally, right? Uh, so keep that in mind. I mean, most Russians don't live in kind of, uh, you know, I don't know what, suburban communities with, with freestanding houses, right? Most of them live in, in apartment blocks. Um, although, as we may have learned already, uh, many Russians will have a small country house called a dacha. Uh, we'll talk about that later if we haven't yet. So, uh, anyway, back to the example. Balshoi dorm. Okay, that would be inanimate. What about balshoi kot, a big cat? Well, that's animate, of course, right? So, let's look at the example. Rybionok rysuyet blank. The child is drawing blank. Okay, so we need accusative. Uh, the kid's drawing a big building uh, or house. Okay, what if the kid's drawing a big cat? By the way, kot is an in stress masculine adjective. Remember, we mentioned that there's some masculine nouns, especially, uh, this is especially likely if they're monosyllabic, right? Like, what often we add endings to those, the stress is going to jump to the ending, right? So quartz happens to be one of those. And that's why we say Balshova kata as opposed to Balshova kota. Okay, number six, Tvoy druk, your friend. I see blank. Okay, we need an accusative, animate. So ya viju tvoyevo druga. Now, a slightly different example, when we smotrim, we're watching something. We're watching 
the same movie. Musmodrim Tvorje Film, Tvorje Film, right, inanimate, so no change. A quick Paslovitsa, uh, the Russian version of making uh, a mountain out of a molehill, is Dielet is Muchi Slana. Dielet is Muchi Slana. Okay, we can understand almost all of that grammar. The only thing missing so far is the, uh, I don't think we've had this preposition, is. That takes the genitive. It means out of or in the, or from. Right? So uh, to make an elephant, slon. Now here that's in the accusative, right? Slana, right? Animate accusative. To make an elephant from a fly. Right? So djelet slana, that's accusative. And then muhi is the genitive of mucha. Uh, and because the genitive is required after this preposition is. Okay, you might answer a few questions here uh, or discuss with a partner if you've got a Russian study buddy or whatever. You read the newspaper every day. online gazetu, right? What about an online newspaper? By the way, you see that term online, right? As you might imagine, a lot of kind of internet internet terms are just borrowed directly from English, right? Just simply transcribed usually into Cyrillic, right, into the Russian version. Uh, anyway, question two. Кто читает русского писателя сейчас? Who's reading a Russian writer right now? Кого, right, кого, whom are you reading? Okay, you might, if you are reading a Russian writer, you might try putting the name into the accusative. Now keep in mind that if the writer is female, the, uh, the names are going to end most likely in a ah or ya, ja, right? So just make them feminine accusative. And if the author is male, then he's going to be animate, right? So you would give what look like the gen genitive forms of the name, like for example, um, Pushkina, that, right? Yachitayo Pushkina. Or let's, you know, some last names are adjectives. Yachitayo Tolstova, Yachitayo Dostoevskova. We'll talk a lot more about that later, about how, how to use Russian names. Uh, number three, do you like to read Russian poetry? Well, if you don't yet, you will later when we get to the end of book two. Okay, number four, uh, which Russian poet do you like to read? Right? Now remember, generally means what kind of, but often it can also just mean which, right? Which Russian poet do you like to read? Or what Russian poet do you like to read? Okay, let's do just a quick, uh, just mop up some odds and ends here. What about those masculine nouns with feminine endings? Right, like papa. Okay, well, let's, let's remember our rule. What, what are masculine nouns with feminine endings? Well, they are masculine nouns with feminine endings, right? That's, that's exactly, they are exactly what they claim to be, right? So, uh, papa is masculine, right? So, we think, say things like moi papa, right? Moi, reflecting the masculine gender of papa, uh, but it happens to take feminine endings. And remember that a, a given word can only take one set of endings. So, papa is always going to take uh, feminine endings. So let's see what happens in the accusative, right? Um, well, you get actually exactly what you would expect. Let's think about dyadya, right? Uh, uncle, right? Of course, that's animate. Okay, so, but but dyadya itself is going to act like a feminine noun. So in the accusative, dyadya is going to follow the a to u, ya to you rule, right? So we get dyadju, right? I see uncle. Ya vizu dyadju. Okay, but anything we add to that is going to be masculine, right? Because djadje is masculine, despite having feminine endings, right? So everything else about this little phrase looks like masculine animate, right? Nashava lubimova djadju. Okay, note the agreement arrows. Uh, let's see some more examples. I see an old acquaintance. Well, it's not komi. That's one of those nouns that... Um, can stand alone, sorry, adjectives that can stand alone as uh, uh, almost like a noun, right? Uh, what about znakomi? Is it animate or inanimate? Well, it's inanimate because it refers, at least the way we're using it, to 
people, right? To a, to a male acquaintance. So let's see how it works in the accusative. Ya vizhu starva znakomava. I see an old acquaintance, right? Everything about that is uh, masculine animate. Uh, let's go back and get another feminine ending example. Yaznayu etava stranava mushinu. Okay, mushina takes the, uh, uh, again, feminine endings, right? Mushinu, but everything else modifying it looks like masculine animate. Etava stranava. Finally, what about a female acquaintance, right? Znakomaya in the nominative, okay? In, in the accusative, that's going to change, of course, right? A to u, ya to you, ya viju, staruyu, znakomuyu. Okay, let's, uh, as usual, when we learn a new case, we're going to learn two additional bits of, of uh, information about how it's used, right? We already said that the, the main use for the accusative is uh, to show that a word is acting as the direct object, right? Uh, but for all, well, almost all cases, right, uh, there are two other important things to learn. Uh, we know the first one already, right, that uh, each preposition in Russian requires a certain case coming after it, right? So every time we learn a new case, we'll learn a few basic prepositions that require that case, right? We already saw one earlier on the poster, za. Uh, takes the accusative in Russian. Okay, uh, so the other big thing are verbs that require a given case. Um, now, we'll, we'll talk about this more later, uh, but basically um, certain verbs, uh, they're usually fairly limited in number, requ essentially require objects in some case other than the accusative. Right, so we'll get to that later. We saw that actually, uh, you may recall, with the verb jilat, right? We talked about how it, to, to wish. We talked about how that's followed by the genitive, and that's what gave us those genitive wishes, like priyatnava appetita, right? I wish you a pleasant appetite, priyatnava appetita. Uh, but we didn't really uh, actively learn any verbs like that just yet. Okay, so for the accusative today, we're looking at certain verbs that are followed by certain prepositions, right? So some verbs simply require a certain case coming after them. Others are used with certain prepositions coming after them, right? Like, let's uh, take some English examples to pay. Well, we would normally say, I'll pay, well, actually, we could. I just thought, we, I'll pay the bill, right? So we, we, we could say that in certain instances. But... Um, how would we say things like, well, I'll pay your drink. That doesn't make much sense, right? We say, I'll pay for your drink. I'll pay for your drink. Okay, so with that verb for to pay, right, quite often it, it requires a certain preposition coming after it. And part of knowing that verb is knowing how to use it, right? Knowing which preposition or prepositions it can be used with. And in Russian, part of that is, is of course, knowing what case follows that preposition. Right, so today we have three uh, verbs that we've already seen that uh, are typically followed by a preposition that in turn is followed by the accusative. Uh, so let's look at these and uh, we'll watch for them in our examples. Platich za sto, right, to pay for, to pay for. Okay, note how we're marking this up, right? The, look at the sto and the kavo. Uh, this is the way we're sort of going to formally mark up verbs in terms of um, the cases they require, right? Or, or prepositions, right? What case do they require? Well, when we write, when we write sto and kavo, that tells us that uh, this preposition can be followed by a thing or a person in the accusative, right? Because sto is the accusative form of sto, right? The word, the question word, what? And kavo is the accusative of the question word kto, right? Referring to people, right? Who? Okay, so that kavo uh, is, that's just the, our little clue for uh, telling us which case we need. So we'll get used to this as we see more and more examples. Uh, so platit za sto or platit za kavo means to pay for something or to pay for someone. Uh, how, what about answering a question? Advichaj na We answer to a question uh, would be the 
best literal translation of that in Russian, right? We answer to a question. We give answer to, or maybe you could say we respond to a question. Отвечать на вопрос. Okay, there we just have a kind of a phrase, right? Just answering a question. That's kind of a little stock phrase. Uh, I mean, I guess there are other things you could answer to or respond to, but we wouldn't really be using those right now. Okay, what about to look at something? Well, kind of like in English, смотреть на что and кого, right? So смотреть на plus the accusative. Uh, and, but note the exception, смотреть film, to watch a movie, right? We don't look at a movie. It's kind of like in English. We don't look at a movie. We watch a movie, right, without a uh, preposition. Okay, what about uh, prepositions that take the accusative? Well, we've got only two, and we just, we've just seen them already, right, just now. Za and na. Okay, so what does za mean? Za generally means for, but... Uh, We'll talk more about that later. There are lots of ways in Russian to translate the English for. Uh, so more on that later. But za can mean for in the sense of in favor of something. Like I'm in, I'm, I'm for it. I'm in favor of it. For example, мы за свободу слова. We are for freedom of speech. And in that use, it's the opposite of против, which takes the genitive, right? Meaning against something. Кто же против свободы слова, right? Who's against freedom of speech, right? So for versus against. And uh, the second use of za, which we just saw, it, its general meaning is in exchange for, right? So think of the idea of exchange. And that also covers the idea of payment, right? You're giving payment in exchange for a service or a product or whatever, right? So this idea of exchange is a useful one. Отец платит за нас. He's paying for us. Он платит за наш обед. He's paying for our lunch. Okay, the most literal meaning of на is on to, right? Uh, or in some cases at, right? Почему ты всегда смотришь на меня? Why are you always looking at me? Right, there's the accusative, меня. Uh, мы смотрим этот фильм, right? Now again, if you're watching a film, a movie, you don't use на, as we just mentioned. Okay, and then again, we've seen this in response to Кто знает ответ на этот вопрос? Who knows the answer to this question? Кто может ответить на вопрос? Who can answer the question? Okay, let's fill in a few examples with these, um, well, more accusatives, including accusatives after prepositions. Okay, number one, новый студент, a new student. Okay, that's animate. Let's ask, why are you looking in this way? Why are you looking thusly, right, так, at the new student? Right, stop staring at the new student. Почему ты так смотришь на, okay, animate accusative, нового студента? Почему ты так смотришь на нового студента? Okay, number two, какой фильм, right? We're asking a question, what kind of film or what, what movie? Okay, that's inanimate. Now, here again, watch out for the word order. We're going to mention that in a moment, right? Uh, what case do we need here? Well, let's look at, we have blank, blank, вы смотрите. Okay, вы is the subject. That's our subject. Then our verb is смотрите. So, you are watching what? Okay, so we need an accusative, right? Okay, since film is inanimate, there's going to be no change here, and we're going to ask, Какой фильм вы смотрите? What film are you watching? Русский, right? A Russian one? Okay, number three. Это русская газета. This Russian newspaper. Okay, uh, feminine. Кто платит за? Who's paying for? Blank, blank, blank. Okay, we need an accusative after the за. Кто платит за эту русскую газету? Okay, number four. Война meaning war. Are you against war? Uh, okay, remember, protiv takes the genitive. Ты против войны, right? Did you come up with the genitive, uh, feminine genitive? Войны, right? Ты против войны? Конечно, of course. Кто же за войну? Who is in favor of war? Okay, number five. Это трудный вопрос. This difficult question. Кто может ответить на blank? Who can 
respond to, so to speak, who can answer to this difficult question. Okay, we know that we need accusative after na. Right? Кто может ответить на этот трудный вопрос? Right? This difficult question is inanimate. It's not going to change in the accusative. Okay, finally, six. Фотография моей собаки. Okay, this is a this is an, a, a kind of example that always confuses students, almost always, uh, early in, in uh, first-year Russian. Let's analyze this phrase carefully. Фотография моей собаки. Okay, photograph, that's obvious, that's in the nominative, photographia. What about maye sabaki? Okay, that's in the genitive, right? Maye sabaki is in the genitive. Okay, so this phrase means a photograph of my dog. Okay, now let's look at what we're going to be doing here. Na što vi smotrite? What are you looking at? Okay, we're going to say at blank, right? We're going to need an accusative. Okay, so we're going to say, I'm looking at a photograph of my dog. Okay, what are we going to be changing here when we put that phrase into the accusative? Right, what is actually the object of na? Fotografia, right? F photograph, that noun, that, that alone is the object of the preposition. So only fotografia is going into the, into the accusative, right? We're not going to take maie sabaki right, which has this genitive meaning of my dog, we're not going to suddenly put that to into the accusative, right, that would make something with, that makes no sense, right, uh, right, we want, just as in English, we would say, I'm looking at a photograph of my dog, right, we keep that of uh, intact, right, in the Russian, we put photographia into the accusative, and we keep the, the of idea expressed in Russian with the genitive intact, right, maye sabaki, will not change. So let's fill in the blank. Na što vi smotrite na fotografiju maje sabaki. Here's one of my favorite Russian proverbs. Uh, sort of like in English we say, give someone an inch, they'll take a mile. Uh, a Russian paslovitsa says, posadi svinju za stol, a naj nogi na stol. Seat a pig behind your table, or we'd say at your table, and she, so to speak, or of course it, feminine, uh, and the feet onto the table. Okay, you see several things going on there. We've kind of left out a verb in the final phrase, right? Russian often does this because of its uh, case endings. It can suggest, for example, motion or, or putting or basic ideas like this with, without uh, articulating the verb, right? So the idea is that if you seat a pig at the table, right, then it'll soon have its feet up on the table, right, it, it will take advantage of your hospitality, and so forth, right, so here we have uh, svinyu, which is the accusative of svinya, svinya means pig. Okay, here's a little discussion project, you might uh, share your political views or whatever, Right, by talking about whether you're for or against these things. Okay, so here are a few examples. You can maybe think of others. Uh, now, remember, if you want to say za, uh, that'll need the accusative. If you want to be against, protiv, that's going to need the genitive. So what about these things? Communism. Well, let's say, how would you say I'm for communism? Ya za communism. Right, what if you're against communism? Ya protiv communisma. Right, there's the genitive ending. Okay, some other examples. Demokratia, capitalism, svoboda slova, right, freedom of the word, literally, freedom of speech. Yadirnaya arrugia, zyatishnichistva, bribe taking. Um, tsar, right, think back to the days of the revolution, right, are you in favor of the tsar or not? And Lenin, Lenin. Uh, yeah, here's a creepy poster. Speaking of animate accusatives, Unishtojim kulaka kak class. We will destroy the kulak as a class, right? Uh, this refers to the period of collectivizatia, uh, that is the collectiv collectivization of agriculture in the Soviet Union in the early 30s, which was a rather brutal uh, process that involved a lot of uh, 
well, widespread famine and, and death by starvation. Uh, if you haven't heard of this, this is known in Ukraine as the Holodomor, which means basically de um, death or eradication by hunger. Uh, so basically that, that refers to the, the Soviet era famines uh, that were widespread in the Ukraine, which is traditionally kind of the, the, the breadbasket of, of, well, first the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union, because there's a lot of very fertile so-called black earth uh, Chernozium, it's called Black Earth Soil down there in that uh, area. Uh, okay, anyway, so the, what, what's the kulak? Well, normally that word means fist, right? But it came to be a term referring to a, a person who was kind of a well-to-do peasant, right? So uh, they were identified as, as class enemies and used often for sort of propaganda purposes to promote the idea that these rich kulaks were uh, subverting, uh, you know, collectivization efforts, right? Because they were greedily trying to hold on to their property and continue exploiting their poorer neighbors. Uh, so there was this so-called uh, dekulakization uh, campaign, or in Russian, raskulachivanye. Okay, so this poster, this poster actually in some ways is rather... Uh, Honest, I mean, in a certain sense, that you have this monstrous tractor about to mow down these uh, peasants, right? Quite often uh, in propaganda posters, this whole process of, of collectivization and especially the collective farms that uh, existed in its wake is is presented in in, uh, in very idealistic uh, images, right? Like uh, fields of grain and happy peasants who've now joined the collective farm and they've uh, been transformed into new Soviet people, you know, with, with uh, bountiful harvests and things like this. So this poster in some ways is, is rather unusual in its sort of uh, brutality. Um, okay, what about pronouns in the accusative? We've got to always, when we add a new case, we've got to add the pronoun forms. And luckily, we know these already, right? Uh, I think we may have even mentioned this at some point. Uh, anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter much. The accusative forms of the pronouns are the same as the genitive, right? Now, remember that if we use these accusative forms after a preposition, uh, if they happen to end in a begin in a vowel like ye or e, we've got to add the n, right? We're always doing that when we use prepositions after a, sorry, when we use pronouns after a preposition, right? So, now let's read these out. <coughs> now, minya. На тебя, на него, на нее, на него, with the N there. Uh, на нас, на вас, на них. Okay, what about, what if we don't have a preposition? We just need a direct object, right? We need to use a pronoun as a direct object. Like, he sees me, I see you, we see him, right? Those kinds of examples. Uh, well, that would be simply, меня, тебя, Его, ее, его, нас, вас, их. Okay, let's look at uh, some examples and just now substitute pronouns for the noun. Ты покупаешь книгу? Are you buying the book? Or are you buying a book? Yes, I'm blank buying. I'm buying it, right? We basically want to plug in an it or a him or a whatever, a pronoun in the accusative. Da, ya, yu, yo, pokupayu, right, feminine. Ya, yu, yo, pokupayu. Blank, interesting. Okay, now we need a, uh, a subject, right? Ana, it, meaning the book, as our subject here. Ana, interesnoya. Ana, interesnoya. Okay, number two. U vas yis novi film. Okay, so film. Let's start by asking what pronoun generally are we going to use to refer to film? Well, that'll, that would be on, right? It's a masculine. So let's say we're asking, do you have a new film? We say, yes, now blank, I am watching. We are watching. Okay, so we're, we're watching it, the film. Okay, so we need a direct object that would be you voir, right? Accusative. Da, suggest you voir smotrim. We're watching it now. Blank is good. Okay, now we're, we're back to needing a, a subject. On Haroshi, 
Он хороший. It, the film is good. Number three. Не вижу, uh, я не вижу Бориса. Где он? Right? I don't see Борис. Uh, where is he? Right? Где он? Okay, so again, we to refer to Борис, we would use он. Okay, let's say, no, I don't see him. Нет, я его не вижу. Uh, he is not here. Okay, so let's be really careful with this one. How do we say someone doesn't exist, so to speak? They're not here. Well, we need нет plus the genitive, right? So there's that non-existence construction. We've got to be very careful. So here we need the genitive of он, which is его. Его здесь нет. Number four, кто они? Who are they? The, right, знаешь, do you know them? We're trying to ask. Do you know them? Okay, that that's an accusative, right? What's the accusative of они? Их. Ты их знаешь? Do you know them? Uh, let's say, I was at their place yesterday. Я был у... Nich, right there we need the genitive after u, and we need to add that n after the preposition. Я был у них вчера, но я их плохо знаю. So I was at their place yesterday, but I don't know, th I know them badly, or I don't know them well. Я их плохо знаю. Number five, ты читаешь эту газету? Uh, are you reading this newspaper? Uh, no, I hate it, right? So we need, again, a feminine accusative. What's the accusative of она? Uh, well, that'll be ее. Я ее ненавижу. I hate it. I hate this newspaper. It's so boring. Okay, now we're back to needing a subject, right? Она такая скучная. Она такая скучная. Number six. Видишь Наташу? Do you see Natasha? Где? Where is she? Okay, we need a subject. Где она? Где она? I don't see her. Accusative. Я ее не вижу. Я ее не вижу. Again, she's not here. Now we need the genitive with this tricky нет plus the genitive construction. Ее здесь нет. Number seven. Ты любишь этого щенка? Do you love this puppy? Oh, who couldn't love that adorable puppy? Uh, da, I, uh, generally speaking, I can't live without it, right? I, I can't even live without it. Я вообще не могу жить без... Okay, remember that без takes the genitive, remember? Okay, it's a preposition, so we... Okay, by the way, what pronoun would we use to refer to шинок? Он, right, masculine. Okay, now we need the genitive after без, and we've got to be careful to add the n after the preposition без. So we'd say без него. Без него. Я не могу жить без него. I can't live without it. Or I can't live without him, the puppy. Uh, okay, one last thing to cover today, word order. So we've mentioned already that uh, as a beginner, you shouldn't worry too much about word order. Of course, that's not to say it isn't important, but as I've mentioned before, I get a lot of questions about word order, and it's often not really that productive, quite honestly, right? Because the answer basically almost always is, well, there's no wrong answer, right? This word order isn't really wrong, but it may emphasize something a little bit differently maybe than what you want to say, but right now, let's maybe look at these horrible grammar mistakes you've made, right? Instead of uh, focus, you know, talking about the, the subtleties of Russian word order. Okay, so let's just say that for now. But of, of course, as we go through Russian, we're, we're going to talk more about word order. Um, uh, the, today, we'll make a fairly simple point, right, that English, because it doesn't have case endings, it relies much more heavily on word order uh, to tell us what role words are playing in the sentence. Right, so if you haven't thought about this, now would be the time, right? Uh, let's say, for example, the man is buying a newspaper. Okay, what's the subject? Uh, man, right? What's the verb? Is buying. And then what does that leave newspaper to do? It's the object, right? The man buys a newspaper. The man is buying a newspaper. Okay, it's the word order there that's really telling us what's the subject and what's the object. Now, you might think, 
well, but isn't it obvious that the newspaper can't buy the man? Yes, in this case, the context makes obvious um, who's doing the buying, right, and, and what's being bought. But other examples might not be that clear, right? So if we take a simple example like the man loves the woman, Okay, what's the subject? Well, the only way we know in English is because the man comes first, right? We're used to what's called SVO word order, subject, verb, object. That's the way we normally expect to be fed the main parts of the sentence, right? So the man loves the woman. It's the word order there that's telling us that the man is loving the woman and not the other way around, right? But of course, if we say the woman loves the man, we haven't changed the words at all, right? The only thing we've changed is the word order, and that in turn has changed what, what's regarded as the subject and what's regarded as the object. Now, generally, Russian is also referred to as an SVO language, meaning it, it also generally prefers this subject, verb, object, word order. But uh, that doesn't always hold because, uh, uh, as we may have mentioned already, Russian word order is flexible, right? Because it has all these endings, right? Which the, it's, and it's the endings that are telling us what role the word is playing in a sentence. So this allows Russian to be more flexible, and uh, what it generally will do is save new or interesting information for the end of the sentence, right? Whatever the speaker regards as the most interesting part of the sentence, or if it's kind of a question and answer or a dialogue, it would opt Often the most interesting thing would be the new part, for example, the, the answer to the question or you know, something new that's being introduced into the conversation. That would generally be saved for the end, right? So generally what comes towards the end is getting more emphasis in a Russian sentence. Okay, so the long and short of it is that, as we know, Russian word order often tells us almost nothing about what a word is doing in the sentence. So we've got to just completely forget about our expectations from English. Let's take just very, a very simple example for now. Um, let's take two sentences, right? Uh, so the first one's very simple. At the Nova Kniga. Okay, so we're, we're pointing at something, we're introducing an idea. This is a new book. At the Nova Kniga. Okay, what if we go on to say something else about that book? Like, uh, uh, the book was written by a Russian, by a famous Russian author, or a famous Russian author wrote the book. Okay, so book, the book is old hat, right? We've already talked about the book. We, the new stuff is the, this famous Russian writer that wrote it. So we would say, книгу написал, no, sorry, книгу написал известный русский писатель. Now look at the word order. Because the writer is the, the new and most interesting uh, part of the sentence, it comes at the end. Okay, but what part of speech is that in the, well, what, what role is it playing in the sentence? It's the subject, right? So what we end up with here is sort of inverted word order, where look at the first word in the sentence, knigu, that's accusative, right? Of course, so it can't be the subject. So you see how if we are insisting on our English word order expectations, we might start reading this and say, oh, book. Book is doing, book is the subject of this sentence. Uh, but if we look at the ending, as we always must do in, in Russian, right, we see knigu, right? It's accusative. It can't be the subject. It's the object, right? So now we're going to have to read further and get the verb, right? We've got to find out what's being done to the book, and also who's doing it, right? So we've got to wait and be patient until we see a verb and then finally a noun in the nominative that's going to be our subject. And we see finally, there's the, uh, the actual subject. Okay, so uh, that may seem like a fairly simple point, but uh, it's, a, it's an extremely important when we're going to keep harping on it over and over. Um, right, that uh, we have to look at case endings, right? Th those, are, those are what are telling us what a word is doing in the sentence. They're not just decoration, right? They're extremely important. And um, every word we see, we've got to pay attention to the ending and listen to what it's uh, telling us. Okay, uh, I think that's enough for today. Uh, until next time, до свидания, товарищи.